Welcome folks, welcome once again to the flip side and tonight we have a true story about the deadly events that drove a once prosperous town on the Kenai Peninsula in Alaska into becoming a ghost town. Now these are events so terrifying that residents refused to ever set foot there once they distanced themselves from it. But first, and if you haven't already, please do hit that subscribe button tap that like button and give the old notifications bell a ring so that you'll be notified as and when new content is added to this new and fledgling channel. So now, without further ado, here's the harrowing tale of the mystery of Portlock, Alaska. <laughs> Port Chatham, also known as Portlock, a bay on the southern tip of the Kenai Peninsula in Alaska, and home to a former village of the same name, hardly seems like the setting for inexplicable terror and fright. Now, early records show that the settlement of Portlock was once inhabited predominantly by Russian and indig indigenous Aleut tribes. The history of human habitation around Port Chatham is relatively short, but it's mainly attributed to the shelter its numerous bays offer ships from the frigid and deadly turbulent waters of the northern Pacific Ocean. Captain Nathaniel Portlock, a member of the British Royal Navy, found sanctuary there in 1786 during his Alaska expedition. Now, during his time there, he praised the natural benefits of the site. But it wasn't until 1900 that an American firm brought in a fleet of fishing boats and built a cannery to take advantage of the calm waters and the healthy run of salmon. The village of Port Chatham grew around this cannery. Now, by all accounts, it was a quaint, tidy and beautiful setting, nestled between the sea with majestic vistas of distant snow-covered peaks. And by 1921, its residents placed it firmly and squarely on the map after establishing a post office. Now, back then, the US Postal Service was not in the habit of simply establishing post offices willy-nilly. The fact that Port Chatham now boasted such a facility suggested that the US government also thought the town ticked all of the boxes for it to see longevity, growth, prosperity and development. But how wrong they were. Now, an unexplained series of mysterious disappearances and deaths where the Kenai Mountains narrowed before plunging into the Northern Pacific gave birth to rumours that began in the 1930s and continue through to this day. Now, these rumours all point to the same thing. Something is definitely not right in Port Chatham. Now, close to Port Chatham is another village by the name of Nanwalek and its eldest resident, Melania Helen Keel, is frequently called upon by other people to share with her memories of how life used to be in this very rugged patch of Alaska. And among her memories are happy ones, spent collecting plants and other ingredients with other younger girls of the town that they would then use to create medicines for the sick. Uh, they, she would also tell of tales of tribal methods of how to best preserve sea lion meat in barrels for winter and other such stories of, of, of her existence. But more disturbingly, she was also one of the few remaining survivors able to recount horrific stories from the town's dark past. Tales of how the once affluent and bustling town came to be a deserted ghost town, how it went on to be shunned by all of those who once lived there once they distanced themselves from it. Now, Melania was born on January 25th 1934 in Port Chatham. It was, at that time, a small fishing village founded on the edge of a peaceful moorage. But when Keel was a young girl, the family, for no reason, abruptly moved away from the village, leaving the house and every timber of its frame behind. Now, in those past times, people would often strip down their predominantly wooden homes, timbers included, and move elsewhere, only to reconstruct their home in pastures new. To not have done so in this case simply indicated a burning and immediate desire to distance themselves from their current residence. Now, the younger Melania over the years would be able to slowly piece together the reason for that relocation at such an early age, and it terrified her. Now, it turned out that what had frightened her parents turned out not to have been one single event, 
but rather a collection of events over a much longer period of time. Now, in regional folklore, the local indigenous tribes would recount stories of a weird creature, like a half-man, a half-beast-like thing, that they called the Nantanak. And it was said to inhabit the forests and mountains around Port Chatham. It was a creature so feared that many of the Aboriginal people refused to stay anywhere near the village. And it was one, or many, of such creatures that, reported, that was reportedly terrorising villages during Melania's early childhood that forced the hands of her parents. Now, Cale isn't the only one to tell of strange events at Port Chatham. One of the tribal elders, Simeon Kvasnikov, said he remembers when Nantinak were blamed for the disappearance of a lumberjack and part-time gold miner from the village, a guy by the name of Andrew Kamluck. The enterprising local was found dead in the woods from a blow to the head. Now, there was a long piece of mining machinery laying close to him and it was thought that that would have been the murder weapon given that it was covered in what appeared to be the victim's blood. But what baffled people at the time is that the potential murder weapon was so large and heavy that no one normal man would have been able to lift it, let alone wield it as a weapon, to a point of having enough dexterity and control to create the injury sustained by the hapless victim. Another tale outlines the experience of a local fisherman by the name of Tom Larson. Now one day he went out to chop wood in order to build some more fish traps, but as he made his way to the waterside location where he planned to work, he saw something large and hairy standing on the beach. Now on seeing that and being aware of the tales of Nantanak and the havoc that they could wreak, uh, he ran home to get his rifle. Unfortunately for him, when he returned to the water's edge, even though whatever it was was still there, it simply just looked at him before slowly retreating back into the forest. And Larson could never explain why he did not fire. And thus started the slow demise of the town, also known as Portlock. Beginning in the 1940s, during the height of World War II, Men from the town would often go up into the hills to hunt dull sheep and bear, but they would never return. Eventually, bodies began washing up on the shores of Port Chatham. But somewhat more disturbing than, than the simple fact of bodies washing up on the shore was the fact that the bodies that were washing up were mutilated to a point that was just in, almost indescribable. Initially, it looked like they'd been beaten to an absolute pulp and then ripped apart literally like limb from limb. Initially, people thought that these were the results of bear attacks, given that bears, especially grizzlies, were and remain a prominent species in the area. However, it was soon pointed out by local hunters and indigenous people that the way in which the bodies were literally destroyed ruled out bear attacks, given that bears tend to rip at their prey with their razor-sharp claws, and such injuries were missing in the cases of the bodies that had been found. So what was it that could have been lurking out in the forests that could do such damage to a human form? Now, in addition to these bodies, several members of the local community had also disappeared over the years, never to be heard from or seen again. Other rumours include clues as to the physical traits of something living in the forests of the region. On one occasion in 1946, hunters followed moose tracks into the forest and came across man-like footprints that had that exceeded 18 inches in length. Now, as they realised, as, as they continued to track the moose, they realised that they and whatever it was that had left these tracks were, in fact, hunting the same animal. Eventually, the hunters came across an area of matted down grass that held all of the indications of an apparent life and death struggle the main indicator being large quantities of thick, warm blood splattered all around the area. Beyond the grasses, the hunters found no further traces of the moose, but they did see more of the large man-like footprints that continued upwards into the cloud-draped mountains. Now, the hunters noted that the prints were now so deeply pressed into the ground that it would suggest that whatever it was was now carrying something of significant weight. And could that weight have been something similar to that of a fully grown adult moose? Now what seemed to be the final straw came in late 1948 when a local and highly respected hunter went into the forest to check his traps. Given that it was snowing, he took his sled and dogs and headed into the wilderness. Nothing seemed amiss, and as evening fell he set about camp, but he had noted that his dogs had started to become a bit antsy in the late, later afternoon. Now given that they'd been locked up in the kennels back in Port Chatham, 
uh, for quite some time. You just put that down to them being jittery and getting used to the sound of the forest. But as he turned and bent to tend to his fire, something crashed through the vegetation behind him, landed on his back and proceeded to rain down punches and blows on his back, neck and on the side of his head to a point that it almost knocked him out. And it was only due to his dogs slipping their harnesses and approaching whatever it was in a very aggressive manner to, to whatever it was that was on his back that, that that creature slinked off back again into the darkness, leaving this guy injured but in, with enough energy to jump onto his sled and he managed to get, make his way back into the town where he immediately sought out the local doctor who set about rendering first aid. Alas, such were the damage to his internal organs that the man eventually succumbed to his injuries. Now slowly the townsfolk started to pick up sticks and leave. By late 1949 the town was pretty much deserted. The only remaining resident being the postmaster who had to wait until the post office would officially close down uh, before his departure. He eventually moved from the town, leaving it to Mother Nature at the beginning of 1950. Now, in more recent times, Nantanak reports haven't stopped entirely, as a local Namwalek man who only wanted to be identified by his first name, Ed, recounts. In 1990, while I was working as a paramedic in Anchorage, we got called out on an alarm for a man having a heart attack at the state jail in Eagle River. He was a native man in his 70s, and after I got him stabilised with IVs, O2 and cardiac drugs, my partner and I began to transport him back to the native hospital in Anchorage. Now, en route to the hospital, my buddy and this native man, an Aleut from Port Graham, started talking about hunting and the wildlife in the area. I also managed to tell him about a time when I'd been to Dogfish Bay and was trapped there at a time by heavy weather. Now, on hearing that, the old boy sat bolt upright in his gurney. Eyes wide, he grabbed the front of my shirt and got right up in my face before growling, Did it bother you? Well, with that question, the hair just stood off on the back of my head. I said yes, and he asked, Did you see it? No, I didn't see it, but intrigued, I asked him if he'd ever seen it. And he said no, but my brother had seen it. It had once chased him. So what was Ed's story? Well, back in 1973, Ed and two other hunters went bow hunting for goats when a storm forced them to take shelter in Dogfish Bay Lagoon. We beached our skiff and let the tide run her dry. After a dinner of broiled salmon, we turned into our tent. Back in those days, the best tent I had was a dark green canvas job with a, cam with a center pole and no windows or floors. We left the fire burning and cleared the pots and pans so as not to attract bears during the night and then we turned in, Ed recounted. In August there was still some light in the sky until about 10 or 11 o'clock. Now I recall that we were all a bit embarrassed about being afraid of what may come to pass as, the night, as night descended on our campsite. We had a flashlight and one rifle in the tent between us and that was locked and loaded. I finally dozed off but woke, woke right up when my buddy Dennis was squeezing my leg. The illuminated hands of my watch showed it was 2.30. Joe, my other buddy, was already sitting up and had the, right, had the rifle in his hand. Both of them were staring intently to the side of the tent. And that's when I heard the first step, not more than 10 feet away from the back of the tent. Slowly, then another and another. Whatever it was, it sounded like it was walking on two feet. It made a semicircle track around the tent but when we finally got enough courage to crawl out of the tent and lift up our flashlight, we saw nothing. No tracks, no sound, no nothing. What could it have been? Now, on the second night, as the second night approached, we were getting ready and we were a bit concerned about what would happen on that night as well, but it never came back on the second night. And, but we'd all decided that if it did actually come back, we were just going to let fly with the rifle and blaze our way out of there. Fortunately, on the third day when the weather broke, we were able to pick up sticks and get the hell out. The Sasquatches, Bigfoot, became something of a popular phenomenon in the 1960s and 70s in the lower 48. The Nantanak in Sukstung uh, culture had always been around for a long time. Now, according to the indigenous people, it may be a different kind of creature, a tragic half man, half beast, who wasn't always in this condition. Apparently, it used to be fully human. Tribal elder Nick Tanape 
uh, said he doesn't discredit the stories about Nantanak, but says he's never seen one. But I do think there's something to them, he said. So if you haven't already, please do subscribe, hit that notifications bell, and you'll be updated as and when there's new content from yours truly. Now, this is a new venture, so I'm trying to get content up at least once a week. Uh, I do have a full-time job, so time is like gold dust at the moment. Um, but as it picks up traction, hopefully I can give a bit more time to it and uh, bring you some more tales. And if you like what you see, be sure to come back, and I will catch you on the flip side. Take care, folks.